Hello, and welcome to our first session of Ed Talks, quick session talks that focus on economic development and recovery for our regional business. Thank you all for attending today. The Rockford Area Economic Development Council has recognized and reacted to serve our region in the best way we can to support our community efforts to respond, recover, and now reopen our local business and manufacturers. Please take time to reference the RAEDC website for additional COVID-19 support and direction. As we look to the future, we at the RAEDC, in collaboration with Rockford University and the Peary School of Business, will be hosting frequent ed talks. These conversations will focus on the economic development issues we face amid this pandemic with the purpose to provide expert guidance on how to adapt and overcome those issues. Today's topic is crisis leadership. With this pandemic, we all have questions and concerns about our personal well being, questions for our family and our friends. We also have questions and concerns for our colleagues, fellow staff, and employees. With business in mind, a couple frequent questions come up. Am I doing my best as a boss during this crisis? Am I leading my reports and my staff the right way? Today, Dr. Maul will share successful leadership techniques that can help your business from the C-suite to the shop floor recover from the economic earthquake we are living through. About Dr. Maul, Dr. Mandolin Maul is the chair of the Puri School of Business, director of the Accelerated Business Program and assistant professor of leadership at Rockford University. With a PhD in organizational development and change, and an MBA in international business, Dr. Mall previously was a faculty member at Tarleton State University and the McLean School of Business at the University of Mary Hardin Baylor, where she taught courses in business management, statistics, and international business. Prior to joining the realm of academia, Dr. Mull occurred over a decade of corporate leadership experience in the fields of healthcare, property preservation, and logistical distribution. Possessing an extensive background in leadership performance, Dr. Mull consults with organizations across the globe, providing analysis and interventions targeted to improve organizational performance outcomes. Dr. Mall also conducts scholarly research pertaining to leadership intentions, change management, and statistical analysis. Before we get started, at the end of this presentation, Dr. Mall will answer questions. Please submit your questions through the chat box function. And now, with great pleasure, I would like to introduce my professor, Dr. Mall. Dr. Mall? Thank you very much, Jared. Thank you, everyone, for um, attending today. This is fantastic. I get quite excited to have the opportunity to share with you all um, a passion for me, which is to be able to talk about uh, leadership and to talk about leadership in uh, a way that I hope is truly meaningful to you and that assists you um, as you go forward. Uh, so today, as we are talking about crisis leadership, certainly very uh, topical, right? And how to lead our employees through a crisis, because uh, there's a lot of unknowns and a lot of folks that are a bit scared. And so um, now is the time for great leadership. Now is the time that we get to step up and really transform um, organizations and transform people. And it's a really fantastic opportunity, honestly. Um, and so hopefully uh, through our talk today, I get this opportunity to share that with you. So I wanted to talk to you first about the fact that a team of sheep led by a lion will always be more successful than a team of lions led by a sheep. What I mean by that is that, you know, if you think about it, if you're not going to step up and lead your people, somebody else may, and they may not be the best uh, fit for your team. What this means, I hear a lot of leaders tell me from time to time that, I, uh, their, their employees, I, uh, maybe they just have a bad team. They don't have a great fit. And what I always try to tell people is that's not true. It starts with you. I, uh, you can find value in every single one of your employees. I, uh, you, you have to find it. I, uh, you have to, you know, show them that you see that, see it. And you have to be completely convinced. You have to be absolutely convinced that you have done your job to show them 
that you recognize their value. And so when we do that, we become lions. We're able to lead uh, in a really fantastic way. And of course I say lions because here at Rockford University, we are the regents and we're pretty proud of our lion mascot. Um, so as I stated earlier, now is the time for great leadership and it starts with each one of us. It starts with you. And it starts with you answering a question of your people every day. There's actually three things that they need to know from you. The first thing is, can I trust you? This means that we have to be very transparent. We have to be direct when people are not performing the way that they need to be. We have to have managerial courage to let them know that we care about them. We're showing them uh, that we want them to be successful and that we're transparently operating uh, based on information that's going to help them be successful. I borrow this quote from Brene Brown who says, clear is kind and unclear is unkind. Uh, when we think about this, what that means is uh, sometimes we try to uh, kind of navigate around difficult topics, especially during a time of crisis. We don't know what all we can share as leaders with our employees, or perhaps we don't feel quite comfortable uh, sharing all of the information that we know. And so to that end, what we can share I always say be as direct as possible. Don't try to couch it in kindness and couch it a certain way, because when you do that, it becomes very inauthentic. And during a time of crisis, your employees want authenticity. They want transparency. Clear is kind, unclear is unkind. When you have the ability to be very direct and help people be successful, and you're telling them what you know and what the path forward is, that tells them that they can trust you. They may not always like what you have to say. They don't have to. They just need to know that what you say and what you're doing is in their best interest or the best interest of the organization. So the first question that your people need to know from you is, can I trust you? Can I trust you to shoot it to me straight? The second one is, do you want me to be successful? Have you given me the tools to be successful? Have you um, cleared out obstacles that are helping me to be successful? This is a really critical role because you and I may think, well, obviously I want my team to be successful. Why, what, what kind of leader would I be if I said I didn't want them to be? But how often are we telling our people that? How often are we saying, I want to see you succeed. I want you to be uh, successful and I want to help you reach your goals. And in order for us to reach our goals, you, I may make decisions that you may not like, but if you trust me enough, I need you to give me the credibility to know that the decisions I make are for your sustainable success. That yeah, what we want for our people is not just for them to be successful tomorrow or just to get the next promotion. We want them to be sustainably successful for the rest of their careers, right? And the rest of their lives. So that's a huge responsibility for us as leaders, but it's a great responsibility. It's an exciting one. That means who better than us to be able to help shepherd our people through crises. So we have to be very explicit as we tell our, our employees, you know, not only can you trust me, but I want you to be successful. And here's the things that I've done to clear out obstacles in order and to equip you in order to make you successful. The last one, do you care about me? Your members need to know if you care about them. Um, fear and faith are born out of the same thing. Uh, this expectation of something we haven't seen or something that has not come to pass and you and I as leaders can reframe fear into faith, into hope, into progress, into positivity. It means you and I will have to act intentionally and I'll get to that here in a moment. But when your people are asking you, do you care about me? It is our job to show them that we do and it not be lip service. It goes back to that authenticity, that, that craving for I'm being transparent and, and letting me know that you're walking along this path with me. You're leading me, 
but you're also here uh, along the way to support me. These are the three questions, my friends, that our employees are asking of us every single day. Can I trust you? Do you want me to be successful? And have you given me the tools to be successful? And do you care about me? You and I as leaders should be ensuring that we are answering those questions every single day to each one of our employees. It really is that critical. So today we're going to talk about leading through the gray, as I call it, I, the gray of uncertainty, the unknown, feeling comfortable with being uncomfortable. I'm, and we're going to talk about organizational unlearning because there's going to be another side of this. And we don't know what that is, but we know it's not going to look like what it used to. And so I think it's really important for us to talk not only about how do we navigate through this today, but what, how are we going to navigate it on the other side of this? And, you know, I don't have all of the answers to that, uh, specifics, right? I, but I do have some opportunities to give you, I, I hope, some tools to think about. So as we talk about leading through the gray, one of the number one issues that I, I come across in my consulting work is everybody always tells me, my company doesn't communicate well. My boss doesn't communicate well. Leadership doesn't communicate well. We're terrible about it. We're all siloed, et cetera, et cetera. And I say, that's really great because that's not unique to your organization. That's every organization that I work with. I'm 90% of great leadership is intentional because we are by our very nature as human beings quite selfish we care about our own survival and our own success um although we can be very altruistic but it takes a lot of intentionality to help other people these are not things that always just happen by accident these are things that we intentionally do so 90 percent of great leadership is intentional and requires us to step outside of ourselves and care about other people and care about the people that we lead just like that, 90% um, of great communication is also intentional. It does not happen by accident. It does not happen by uh, us kind of going through the motions. And so because of this, we have to be very intentional on how we communicate. And I've actually created a guide that I'm sure to assist you uh, with this. We're going to give you this uh, presentation, which has these all hyperlinked. But when your employees are going through a crisis, just like you and I will go through any type of, of grief pattern in our lives, um, our employees are going through them as well, the five stages of grief, right? The denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And what I've done is created uh, kind of a guide for you that gives you some descriptors of your employees' behaviors as well as um, ways that you and I can react to those behaviors to help navigate them through these stages. This is really, really important because we are seeing that our employees are reacting differently right now. And that's to be expected. Uh, and so in order to best help them, we have to kind of think about how we can uh, identify where they're at in the grief cycle and then what our roles are to help navigate them on the other side. So this guide will be available to you. Um, in the sake of time, I wanted to kind of just show it to you, but you'll have this opportunity. I also created a worksheet. So say that you're going to have a meeting with your team. Again, effective communication is intentional. It means that we do have to sometimes get out a pad and paper or open up a, a spreadsheet uh, and, and start kind of typing some things up. And thinking about, with a lot of intentionality, who is on my team? What's, who are the informal leaders? Who are the people that kind of have everybody else's ear that I need to make sure I, I have bought in? I'm, it's important to think about what do they know and what do they think they know? Guys, we don't always give our employees enough credit. They know a lot more than we give them credit for, more often than not. Uh, they hear things and in absence of great communication, they feel the vacuum, right? So they feel that void by rumors or fear. And again, it goes back to our job to shift that back towards faith. But we have to be intentional about how we do that and identifying that. 
So asking these kind of questions of ourselves really forces our hand to be intentional, to really think through how we're communicating with our team members. I think it's important to think about what are our employees likely concerns and what are potential areas that they're gonna resist. If I can identify my resistors first and I can get them bought in, the rest of it's gravy, right? Because if I can get the folks who are really concerned and really gonna kind of, you know, put a stake in the sand and say, I'm not, I'm not on board with this, then we really, I really can get somewhere with everyone else. The rest of the folks are gonna follow along. And so I'm this guide and this worksheet, I hope will be something that is useful to you. And so I'm um, again, you'll have access to that. Oh, of course I did this. This is always me when I'm working on things. Sorry, friends. All right, so leading through the gray, uh, continued is evaluating participation versus commitment. So I have a friend who hates when I use this analogy, but one of my former students taught me this years ago. And he said, if you thought about your breakfast, I'm your, the chicken was a participant with the egg, but the pig was committed with your bacon. Now we don't want our people to be quite that committed, but if we think about the difference between maybe a superficial type of uh, participation versus a deeper sense of unity and commitment towards our collective goals. Once we identify our employees' stages of kind of where they're at in the grief cycle, where they may be resistant to how we're trying to move forward, it's important for us to be thinking about how deeply are they entrenched. We can lose a lot of really talented employees in the middle of a crisis. Great performers uh, who always worked really well in a structured environment can start to crater. I, when we when we start to have a whole bunch of unknowns and a lot of gray areas. And that's when it requires mine and your best leadership skills to be put into action. And so that's what's really exciting about a time of, of uncertainty is for us to really be able to, as I said earlier, do our best leadership. Um, so we want to be thinking about their reactions and be thinking about, do I have someone who's on my team that's more superficial level? Or do I have people who are really entrenched, that they really are excited about the work that they're doing and they're fully committed to where we're going into the future, even though we may not have you know, clear guidelines right now? It's our job as their leaders to inspire them, to show support, right? We've got to remind our followers that we believe in them. So, I can go out and tell people, go and inspire your people, uh, but it doesn't do a lot of good if I don't give you some ways in which to do that, because I get asked that a lot. How do I actually go and do that? How do I show support for my followers? The reality is between anything that really matters, we're always going to have hard times. We're always going to have um, you know, periods of strife. I am a sucker for the underdog type stories and movies. That's why I'm a diehard Texas Rangers baseball fan. Um, and so I love, uh, you know, the comeback kids, right? And and we know that there is, you know, there's always that opportunity for people to give up. There's always that opportunity for people to fail. It's the people who keep going forward. Circumstances are rulers of the weak, but they are assets of the wise. So what I mean by that is people who want to, uh, you know, play the victim. I've, oh, this is happening, it's out of my control, I can't do anything about it, are being ruled by their circumstances. People who utilize those circumstances to reframe their strengths, to reframe where they can go, to reframe opportunities, to reframe that fear into faith, really are the ones that always succeed. And so, you know, I, I love this saying that, you know, the grass isn't greener on the other side, the grass is greener where you water it, right? So that means that we, it's so easy when we're going through a crisis for people to be thinking about kind of this victim mentality and blaming it on our circumstances and, and feeling a loss of control. Um, 
and and that's easy and there's not a lot that that um, inspires me there what does inspire me is saying okay we can't do anything about this but what can we do about ourselves what can we do about our success what can we do within our round reframing it what can we do okay we know the things we can't do now what can we do um, and so really thinking about that. Circumstances are rulers of the weak, but they are assets of the wise. And so I created a guide for you that talks about a circle of control. And I, I have three very bad Basset Hounds. I, I cannot get my Basset Hounds to do anything. It's amazing that I am a college professor and that I am a consultant and that people actually listen to me because these three beasts do not and and i bribe them i don't bribe other people i'm some i say that because my circle of control is tiny friends it is so small i can control pretty much my reactions to things right i would really like to be able to control a lot of other things but the only thing i can really control is what i put into myself and what i put back out into the world and what I put back out into the world is bigger. That's my circle of influence. My circle of influence says that what I take into me has an impact. And I have to be very cognizant of how I'm impacting other people. We as leaders have a huge responsibility to take care of our, of our followers, and take care of our employees. So when we're thinking about what is it that I'm taking into myself and putting out into the world, I have a very expressive personality. I don't know if you can tell that about me. I'm, and I, so because I have a very expressive personality, when I am in a great mood, it is fantastic. Everybody else is in a great mood. It's very contagious. And when I am in a very bad mood, aha, uh -huh, it is also contagious. And that means I have to be very cognizant and, and refer back to my circle of control. So my circle of control is very small. I, it's only really what I put into myself, what I put out, the circle of influence is larger. It's how I'm putting an impact on people and how those people could even impact others. And then the last circle, the biggest one, is our circle of concern. Uh, this is really kind of everything, right? It encompasses our circle of influence. It encompasses our circle of control. But too often in moments of crises, we confuse our circle of concern with our circle of control. Friends, we've got to reframe that. We've got to rethink that. Your employees could be getting so bogged down that they're thinking about that circle of concern as if it's something they can control. And we have to say, it's outside of your circle of control. Remember your circle of control is very, very small. Your circle of concern, much larger and those things are going to have an impact. They're going to be things that we need to be a cognizant of, but we have to bring it back to our circle of control and our circle of influence and how that can have an, a ripple effect. This is where we really gain some power in times of crisis. This is where we really get this opportunity to reconnect back to what am I dealing with right now and what circle does that fall into? And I'll tell you, I really think about that. I, I literally, I'm um, as a leader here at the Perry School of Business, when, you know, when I'm working with my team and I'm working with our students and I'm working in consulting projects, I, I can be sitting here thinking about a lot of things and I have to go back and go, wait a second, what circle does that fall into? That's circle of concern. I'm getting, I'm spinning my wheels. I'm getting too caught up in that. I got to bring it back. So you'll have access to this guide. I hope that it's something that will be useful to you. It's very much, you know, a lot of times our best leadership tools are very basic tools. They're not these big, huge, fancy, glossy things. They're very simple stops, very simple questions that we have to ask ourselves and kind of figure out um, where we're at and where we're going. So. The, going back to our circle of control, we are uh, recipients of what we put into ourselves. And we need to be a little bit selfish about that during times of crisis as leaders. Too many people are counting on us for us to be negative. Too many people are counting on us 
for us to be shooting down uh, possibilities, for us to be going down and getting caught up in our circle of concern. We've got to think about our circle of control the most when we're in the middle of a crisis because it directly impacts that circle of influence. And that means we've got to be very careful about what we allow around us, who we listen to. Uh, I will tell you, I am reading, I think it's eight or nine different books right now because I, I, I read like a page in different things and I skip around. Um, but they're leadership books, they're positive books, um, they're books about um, I, you know, positive influencers in, in history, and all these different kind of things that I'm trying to read because I want to make sure that what I'm putting into me is the very best so that I can put that back out to the people that I lead. It's a huge responsibility to be a leader. Leadership is a gift and it's one we're only given for a little bit of time. It's not something that we have forever. And it certainly isn't a weapon. And so we have to be very careful about what we're doing and how we're conducting ourselves during a period of crisis to best support our followers. And this helps inspire them. It starts with us. So I said that that's kind of how we help navigate our people through a crisis, but there's gonna be something that we, on the other side of all of this. And we're gonna to have to figure out how we're gonna operate on the other side. And so the experience that we used to value pre-COVID-19 may no longer be relevant in a post-COVID-19 world. And so that means that we're going to have to be thinking about um, what is it that's going to help our people and help ourselves and help our organizations be successful on the other side. I challenge you to kind of think about how you're preparing to show your own potential because potential is going to be critical, I think. I think it's far more critical uh, and far more valuable to be able to tell someone uh, how you, the potential that you have to get someone from point A to point B versus uh, what you've done in the past, right? Because what got you here won't get you there. Uh, that's a great book uh, by Malcolm. Uh, uh, glad starting back here uh, behind me um, and it's a great book title what got you here won't get you there and he wrote it years and years ago and it was true then but it's even more true now what got us to where we were is not going to be what gets us into the future it makes us successful in the future potential our ability to think outside of the box or work collaboratively teamwork dynamics um, our abilities to be more agile all of these kinds of things are gonna be much more valuable going forward. And so we need to be thinking about how are we preparing ourselves as leaders to show that type of potential? And how are we preparing our followers to show theirs? Um, I tell my students when they're looking for jobs, you know, your experience is great, but your experience was contingent upon the context of where you got that experience, where you accrued it. Contexts change all the time. The content may not, but the context does. And so the context to me is far more important because I can take someone who has content and put them in a whole bunch of different situations and they react completely differently. And you probably have seen that as well. So thinking again about how we prepare our followers to show their potential, how they their potential for growth, their potential for adding value in the future, that's a framework that you and I need to be working toward to really help our people. I, when we're in periods of crisis, we've all heard about the, the fight or flight. I don't know if you've heard the fight, flight or freeze, um, but they are all operating the same way. And um, these, it will happen in our body, uh, this chemical reaction will happen in our body to have us fight, flight or freeze regardless of if you and I are currently in a crisis or, or facing a threat or if we're just thinking about it. This is why anxiety is so dangerous, right? And it's dangerous for our people. And this is why that reframing, that, that fear uh, into faith, why the circle of concern is, is uh, so important to recognize that it, what is it that concern isn't necessarily what's in our control. All of this is so important because it's not sustainable 
to keep operating on that fight, flight, freeze adrenaline. You know it. Uh, some of you may be feeling that burnout at this point already, right? We are day six, what is it, 66? Uh, I'm, and yeah, it's, it's very difficult for us to get ourselves out of that. And so what it's going to require is intentionality. It's going to be there when we have to get on the other side, we're going to have to start thinking about when do I have to stop living in this survival mode? When do I stop living in these unprecedented times? When do I stop living in the unknown or a period of uncertainty? And it, nobody's going to tap you on the shoulders and tell you, now's the time, right? You're going to have to take charge of that, friends. You as the leaders, that's the responsibility we have. We have to have these kind of questions where we're asking, when do I get out of survival mode and get into success mode? I'm, I personally, I like sticky notes. I have a whole bunch of sticky notes everywhere. So I like sticky notes and I, I have sticky notes on my desk that ask, am I surviving or am I succeeding? And which mode should I be in right now? That helps me, it's a brief moment. I see that sticky note, I think about it and I think, survival mode, okay. Is that where I need to be? Yeah, for right now. I'm, right now it's fine. And if I can keep thinking about that, and some people are much better than I am about putting like tasks on their calendars or weekly alerts or things like that. I'm, I like sticky notes. I'm a little old school in some ways. I'm, but if you can give yourself those pause moments, friends, it takes such a small amount of time, but what it allows you to do is be intentional about the work that you're doing. We will get caught up and we'll keep running otherwise, and we'll run ourselves into the ground. And what kind of example does that set for our people, right? So we really need to be thinking about, yes, we've been running on, on fumes. A lot of us have been running, running, running for, for two months now through this crisis, and we're trying to figure out, and we're trying to make do, and we're figuring you know, how to do this now, and the world's in chaos, and all of this kind of stuff. And we're still gonna be there for a while, right? But we have to figure out at what point do we shift over? And I can't tell you when that's going to happen, but you can tell yourself when it will. But you cannot do that unless you're intentionally taking these moments to check. And I really strongly encourage you to utilize that, to just take these brief moments to check in with yourself to say, is it time for me to shift back now out of this survival mode into a growth oriented, strength focused mode? rather than this kind of fear response that I'm in. It's not a negative thing that we've been running in, in the environment or the way that we've had to, right? We had to do it. it this was kind of our circle of control of what we could, could get through. But now is important for us to remember that on, at some point we're going to have to shift and nobody's going to tell us when that point comes, right? We can already see that right now with the you know, soft reopening of things. I'm, it, it, there's not a light switch I'm, unless you create it and you have to create it for yourself and you have to create it for your people because it will benefit you, yourself and your organization the best way. And remember throughout all of this, you are a leader. People are looking to you and in times of crisis, we always look to our leaders. We always look to the people who are stepping up. And take that confidence of, I have a responsibility and I'm glad that my people have me to lead them. That's not, that's not cocky, that's not being arrogant, that's saying, I care enough, I'm passionate enough, I desire the right outcomes to help navigate my people forward, and I'm the right person for the job. I'm the right person to help them forward. Because if you can't say that to yourself right now, then you shouldn't be leading your folks, right? <laughs> so I'm. Um, you should be able to say that. Who else better than me right now than to, to do this? Because I believe in my people and I believe in the outcomes of where I'm trying to get folks to. So although this is an uncertain time, with the right leadership, we are gonna use these circumstances for growth. We're gonna use these circumstances as an asset, not as a victim mentality. Right? We're going to put it back into our circle of control of what we can do. 
and our circle of influence and how we're impacting people and how we're impacting our followers, our organizations and ourselves. Because we're going through this as well. This is difficult when, when our teams are going through crisis, our organizations going through crisis, our families, our home, our, our communities, the world, and ourselves, and we're trying to lead. Hopefully these tools that I'm providing with you today um, are going to be helpful. I really hope so, because I know that they work for me. I know that they work with others that I've, I've uh, assisted in my classrooms or in consulting projects. And I really believe I'm in great leadership. And I want you to remember this. We're not denying the reality of the situation we're all in. We're denying the finality of it. This is gonna pass, but it's up to us as leaders to ensure that we are stronger and that we are more equipped on the other side. That we didn't use this time to kind of fall apart, even though you know we had to go through the grief process. I'm, it's up to us to ensure that we're all stronger and better on the other side. Don't deny the reality, just deny the finality of it, okay? So I challenge you before we get to questions, I'm, I ask you this question of what are you doing today to make you more on the other side of this? We don't know what the post-COVID-19 world is gonna look like, right? We keep talking about a new normal, but we really have a new abnormal until we have a new normal. And we don't really know when that new normal is gonna to start to feel like normal. Um, but we know it's not gonna look like it used to. So, I want you to be thinking about what is it that we need in the future? Do we need creativity, agility, education, training, transparency from our leaders, authenticity, potential? I'm, you know, authentic leadership was born out of I'm, situations like 9-11 and the Enron scandal, I'm, Worldcom, all of those kind of things that were going on in the world and this craving for authentic leaders. I believe what we're going to see, and it's really early to tell right now, but it, through my research and through um, conversations I'm having with other um, leadership academicians and consultants, I believe what we're going to see, the next phase of leadership is gonna be empowerment. What that means is empowerment leadership says, we don't do everything for our people. We give them the tools and the resources. Remember that goes back to question number two, do you want me to be successful? Uh, that we should be answering for our people every day. If we're giving them the tools and the resources to go into the future, and we kind of give them the parameters and we let them lead, we let them, them run um, and be successful uh, on our team. And it's gonna be, I think, much more of a um, horizontal type of leadership that we're going to be seeing in the future. I don't know yet. We, you know, obviously this is also very, very new. Uh, but these are the kind of conversations we're having because so many of us had to rely on each other to, to kind of pull things together during this crisis. And we're going to continue to have to do that. And so empowerment leadership is, I think, going to be the new, the new type of leadership that we see born out of this crisis. And uh, I think it'll be really interesting. But I want you to be thinking about what is it that you need to look like on the other side of this? And what is it that your people need to look like on the other side? What are you doing today to get you there? What are you doing today to bridge you on the gap? You know, some, I, when I do some executive coaching with people, a lot of time when they can't see past some of their mistakes or some, some of their problems, I'll say, tell me where you are today, tell me where you wanna be. And that can be, you know, just write it down, write on one column, here's where I am today, the next column, here's where I want to be tomorrow. You can do it for your personal life. You can do it for your professional life. And once you write those two columns down, whether you're looking at professional or, or personal, then we can start devising a strategy. Um, but a lot of times people get stuck in their heads and I have to kind of pull them out a little bit. And so it's a very simple task again to ask people to do that. But I can see people getting, uh, you know, being able to bridge the gap. They can typically solve their own problems once they see it that transparently, that that I'm uh, uh, visibly on paper or on a spreadsheet. So I do encourage you to be thinking about that. Where are you at today? Where do you want to be on the other side of this? 
and then start thinking about what you can do today to bridge that gap. Success does not happen without intentionality. Great leadership does not happen without intentionality and great communication does not happen without intentionality. So if you learn nothing from me today, I hope you at least learned intentionality. These things do not happen by, uh, by mistake. We have to work at it. And I think we're up for the challenge. So with that, um, I open us up for questions or feedback. Uh, Jared, I think you were managing the chat room for us. I was, thank you so much. We have a few questions here. Great. And start with the first question. How can leaders who may not have been as transparent as possible become more transparent, believable, but not perceived as fake? Yeah. Oh, that's such a good question. I love that. That's great. So um, I think humility, I think humility is the greatest uh, asset that a human being can have. I think it's the most attractive quality a person can have. You know, I'm, it, it's funny, I, I was telling my students one night, and, and Jared knows this because I, he asked me once about emotional intelligence, and I said, I'm still working on that myself. But I, I had a moment in class one night, I, a student, uh, God love him, said something that was kind of a boneheaded moment. And uh, I, I got a little fussy, I'm um, out of love, but I, I did get fussy with him uh, in my expectations. And I took, I, I got a hold of it, told everybody to go to break. They came back into the room and this is my MBA class. This is a leadership class, my first semester teaching here. Um, and I said, mea culpa. Mia Coppa, I am guilty. I did not exhibit good leadership to you just now. This kiddo said, you know, a boneheaded thing that he, you know, wanted to be in another class. Um, and I said, sure, I am not your jailer. You can leave this class at any time. Um, and I said, that, that's on me. I was not leading well. And I apologize to you. I did not send a good example. I can come up with an excuse as to why. I, I knew I was not in a good uh, emotional state before I walked into that class that night. And the students and I had a conversation about that. And it's funny because the students always tell that story about the kiddo who made the comment. And we all give each other a hard time. He's been a guest speaker in my classes ever since he's graduated last year. But I'm, students were talking about the, the other night and they said, honestly, Dr. Moll, we think that was probably one of the best lessons we ever saw. We got to see you be real with us. You messed up and you owned it in front of us. And that's what we needed to see. We really needed, I think it made us respect you even more because you were willing to, to admit in real time, you didn't come back later. You didn't do, you just said, I'm guilty. That That's on me. I did not set a good example. And so I think when we do that, I think that authenticity comes through. And so, but it, it takes managerial courage. I'm, we don't like to say that we're wrong. I'm, I'm stubborn. I'm, and I, so I don't always love doing it, but it's the right thing to do. I'm, if I truly care about my work and I truly care about the people I lead and I do, I live for them. They're my purpose. And so that means I have to humble myself and, and admit it. And so I, if you haven't been uh, transparent in the past, I would highly encourage you to, to consider ways to go back to folks that you feel like maybe you haven't always been so transparent with and just put it on the table. Hey, I know maybe I haven't always been as transparent with you and I'd like to change that. And I think when you do that, you really get an opportunity. They may not trust you immediately at first, but that's okay. Keep working at it um, and, and ask them to hold you accountable. That's important. Every great leader should want to be held accountable. And so ask them that, say, I want to be transparent with you. And if you feel like I'm not, I want you to be, to hold me accountable to that because I want to grow in this and I would like to grow alongside with you. Thank you. We have another question. Okay. It's better to be more open to staff, even if it creates uncertainty amongst the staff. Yeah. Is it better? Yeah. I think honestly, I'm, I do. Right, so I am one of those types of leaders that uh, I'm a terrible liar. It shows up, this expressive face, it shows up on my face immediately. So um, I, I don't, uh, I'm not great at it. So I, I tell my people what I know. 
I really do. I'm there are times I'm where you have to be respectful to uh, people's privacy or something like that. In which case, I can say I'm I'm not at liberty to discuss that. I'm and and I think that's okay. I when you can sit there and say that, but I, I try to always let my people know everything I know. And what I'll say is I don't you know, especially when we're kind of going into all of this, where we're going to be on, on cl in classes, you know, on ground for how long, what all was going on. And all I could tell my people was, when I know things, you'll know it. And I promise you that as soon as I have information, you're going to have it as well. And I understand we're all scared. And I understand that we're all kind of freaked out and we're balancing a whole bunch. And in addition to all of us going through it, our, our students were going through all of these types of things. But if we all keep communication open and we all keep talking, we're going to navigate through this. And I found that even though there was a lot of uncertainty and even though people were scared, people were, were okay. I'm, they didn't need answers so much as they needed trust and comfort. They needed compassion and they needed people to understand. They needed me as their leader to understand that we were navigating into unknown and that and that it mattered to them. And so it wasn't so much about me having answers as it was about me showing support and trying to be um, as transparent as I could be. Okay, thank you. Hopefully that answered that. <laughs> we have another question. Okay. We are dealing with some fearfulness from staff members. What do you suggest about dealing with that fear about returning to the workplace? We've outlined safety protocols but this is a deeper concern. Sure. Yeah, so that's a great question. And I will tell you guys, we do a really good job of, you know, coming out with plans and talking about things in almost a clinical way as leaders. Here's the parameters, here's the policies, here's the blah, 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 right? But it's people, it's people, guys. It's people who are scared. And we gotta come back and, and, and we gotta address that elephant in the room. Hey. I know you're scared and and there's a lot that we can't protect here's the things that we can protect and we want to be able to support you and we want to hear your concerns we want to hear I'm um, where you have uh, you know your biggest concerns I'm um, ways that you you need us to answer i um, because a lot of times it's people asking questions about you know, how often is it, you know, things going to be cleaned or this kind of stuff. Um, and what happens if somebody gets sick? Uh, well, I know about it. And are you going to take care of me? Are you going to look out for me? And it goes back to answering those three questions too for our people. Um, can I trust you? And right now that's what they're asking. Can I trust you to keep me safe? And your response as an organization is oftentimes, yes, I'm giving you these parameters. Great. But it's also that third question that they're asking you. Do you care about me? Am I a pawn to help keep your economic driver going? And that's what I see a lot of it. I've been working with a bunch of companies throughout this crisis and employees getting on Facebook or, or uh, Instagram and talking about, um, you know, my health is being put at, at, at risk uh, for the almighty dollar and those kind of things. And I go back and I say, the answer that you have to tell your people is we are in a situation where we are trying to protect you short term and long term with what 26 million people out of jobs right now 15 percent unemployment we need to ensure that we're putting food on your table for as long as we can possibly put food on your table i have a responsibility to not only the people that I lead within the organization, but all the people who are, have a vested interest in my company being successful to keep putting food on their tables, right? So a company I'm, I'm consulting with out of Oregon, Illinois right now, I tell them all the time, it's not just the people that work in your company, it's all the people that rely on that company to be successful, which includes that community, which includes all the end users who buy their products. And I say, so you have to have the conversation with your employees that says, I'm not only taking care of when you come into the door of how we're maintaining cleaning or social distancing and all these policies, but I also have a responsibility to make sure that I put food on your table for as long as possible because the, the 26 million 
people without jobs, the 15% the unemployment rate, we want you to be able to keep your home. We want you to be able to, one day we are gonna get on the other side of this. We're not denying the reality, we're denying the finality, right? And so you have to talk about that in a very compassionate way, uh, not just the short term, but also the long term. And let people know, hey, I know you're scared, but understand that we're humans in these, in these offices making these decisions. And we're scared too. And we're all in this together. We're trying to figure out the best path forward. And it does take balancing. And, and we're doing the very best that we can. And we're gonna keep doing the very best that we can. We commit that to you, that we're going to do the best that we can. And I think when we start to have those types of conversations, we're addressing that, do you care about me? That human component. And we're taking out a little bit of the clinical component. People don't wanna feel like a robot, they're not. But unfortunately, when we go into planning mode as leaders, typically that's what we do. We start talking strategy, we start talking facts, we start talking policies and procedures. And we forget to first lead with compassion. And the compassion has to be first. And the compassionate part is also making sure that we're keeping our people sustainably successful. Sustainably successful is crucial here. It's not just short term. There's gonna be lives to lead on the other side of this and we've gotta make sure that we're taking care of our folks for that. Thank you very much. We have a couple of more questions before we end. So here's the, the second to last question. And I like this one. How do you get your leader to listen to your ideas? My boss only listens to the same two people and nothing ever changes. Nice, I do like that question. That's a good one. I'm, so a lot of that is, you know, I don't know. I'm a little spunky though, but I, I go in and, and I'm transparent about it. Hey, I have some ideas and I don't feel like they've been getting traction. And I, I, I'm interested in, I'm kind of wanting to work with you and figuring out how I can make my ideas, you know, I, be something that can be implemented. I'm, I think a lot of times we have to have conversations, leaders need to be reined in too. Like I said, all great leaders should want to be held accountable. And so to that end, I'm, I want, you know, I don't deny that there can be times that I show biases to certain people's ideas or certain people on my team. It's not intentional. I, we gravitate towards the people who come and um, ask for help. We gravitate towards the people who we tend to like people who are like us and like people like us. Um, so or we like people who like us. We like people who are like us. And that's not a good team, I promise. Nobody wants a team of mandolin moles. It is not, there's too, that's too much energy. I'm, I, you've got to think about the skills that you offer that offset your current leader. So maybe you are an idea person, maybe you're a strategist, maybe you're um, somebody who can really analyze data really well, maybe you're a great communicator, but you need to think about what value add you specifically bring to the table. You come in and say, I know I'm really good at this area and I'd like to be able to shape some ideas going forward that the team can use focused on this. I'm um, be very specific about what it is, what value you bring. The more that you show and articulate, verbally articulate what your value is to your leader, the more likely they are to start listening to you, the more likely they are to start utilizing your skill sets better. I'm um, unfortunately a lot of times we get caught up and we we just kind of go with what we know or we go with the people that are a lot like us and we don't mean to do it. Um, most of the time, I'm not saying that there aren't some nefarious actors out there, but I'm, I like to believe the best in people. Um, and so I think that, you know, really having a transparent conversation about what you think you bring to the table and how you think you can help and that you have the desire to help. Not that, well, so-and-so always gets the ideas or so-and-so always gets these. It's not a bad thing. It's your circle of control, right? Your circle of control is what's gonna be very, very important there when you have that conversation. Here's what I control, can control and here's what I would like to influence. Focus it on what you bring to the table, what you think you can, can add and ask them for their help to help you use that to influence the team. And that should hopefully get you uh, further along uh, in your discussions and get you some opportunities. 
Thank you again. And our final question, I, I do have my pen ready for your answer. Uh, question, of the books you're reading, would you share a few leadership titles which give strong examples on uh, uh, examples of how, tools, empowerment, etc.? Yeah. Oh, okay, great. I'm um, so a really fantastic book that I love. I one of my faculty is a, a graduate, recent graduate of our MBA program, is now using this in one of our classes as a textbook. It's called Good Authority by Jonathan Raymond. Good Authority is a fantastic book. It talks about the difference between context and content. It talks a lot about accountability. I'm fantastic book. So Good Authority is is probably one of my new favorite ones. Um, I'm also really in love with the book Alive at Work. I'm the author is uh, escaping me right now. I know his last name starts with a C. It's Daniel something Champ. I want to say I'm. But it's Alive at Work. Alive at Work talks about how we can engage. It's kind of psychological, but it's how we engage our, our seeking system to help us be intrinsically motivated and how we can help our employees be intrinsically motivated. I'm, that's a really fantastic one. I'm, there's, I love John Maxwell's 21 Laws of Leadership. That's my old, my old go-to. Uh, I always read that. I'm, yeah, I think I'm, I'm trying to think of some others that I, I have a whole a mess of them at home right now. How to be a great boss um, is a good one that I'm, I'm just now starting to get into. And I, yeah, so I, I think those are kind of the ones that stick out the most to me. Uh, and I would highly, highly encourage I'm good authority. I and love always is actually a really good one. If you're looking at like servant leadership or compassionate leadership, servant leadership by James Hunter is fantastic as well. I'm so yeah. I'm a book nerd. I'm, my mother's a librarian. You can tell that it, I. <laughs> oh, it's great to hear awesome ideas on on new reading. Thank you and and thank you so much, Dr. Mall, uh, for thank such you. a great presentation on the strategies to help understand and address crisis leadership in our business and, and in our daily life. We all appreciate your time and expertise, and we're all very fortunate to have you and the resources of Rockford University available to us all. Uh, thank you all uh, that attended today's webinar. We at the RAEDC hope you found value in today's presentation, and you can take what you have learned here today with you to your workplace and your daily life. Just some quick housekeeping. Our, our next webinar will be how small business can navigate the pandemic. That'll be on May 27th at 11 o'clock a.m. It's in partnership with Henshaw. For more information on that webinar, you can visit the RAEDC webpage. Uh, just click the menu tab and you'll find our events button. Please do not hesitate to reach out to Rockford University for additional support and resources. They're a great institution and, and they are more than willing to help anyone in need. Uh, we have a powerhouse of a university right here and it's, it's, such a, it's a blessing to us all. Again, thank you all for attending today's presentation. Enjoy the coming weekend and, and please take time to recognize the sacrifice so many have, have given for our great nation this weekend. Thank you all again. Uh, enjoy and talk again soon. Thank you all.